Um, if you have not had a class with us yet at the actual UCLA Teaching Kitchen, welcome. This is the kitchen for the majority of it, what you can see of it. Um, it is bigger and nicer slightly than my uh, home kitchen. So um, there's a little bit more space for me to work with. There's a little bit bigger equipment for me to work with, but uh, we're sticking with things that everyone can make. We're sticking with things that you don't need any special ovens for. You don't need to have a big industrial kitchen for this. So um, don't, don't let that sway you. Uh, I, I know that sometimes when I watch cooking shows on TV, it's like, well, of course you can do that. You have like a massive restaurant to work in. How am I supposed to do that in my tiny apartment? But um, we're gonna still be dealing with the same kinds of ideas and uh, concepts and mostly we're dealing with some technology. So uh, like I said, if there's any issues, please just Amy, let me know or unmute yourself or chat in the box. And if you can't hear me, then we'll try to figure it out. Um, because it is a much bigger space, and so uh, I'm going to, uh, I'll try to use my, my stage voice, but um, we'll just see how it goes. So, we are doing like a Middle Eastern meal prep this week. I'm really excited. A lot of my favorite flavors and a lot of my favorite foods that I love to have around in the house to snack on all week long. Um, we're making salmon today, so a little different than chicken. I get pretty sick of eating chicken breast all the time. So uh, salmon is a really good way that you can also have really healthy protein and Amy will tell us all about how good it is for us. And uh, so I've got some things, I'm gonna get the phone and kind of show you close up on what I've got some things already prepped out and then we're gonna get right to some of the fun cooking products. So uh, this, is, this is gonna be the issue is I'm gonna have to get a different like camera set up I think for moving things around like a GoPro or something, but um, we will figure that out. So uh, to start with, I just have a few things already done um, for time, obviously. I've got my lettuce already chopped up and washed. Make sure that you wash it really well, air dry it or spin dry it. Uh, chop that up and preferably using sustainable packaging and materials here at the kitchen. We have a lot of washable plastic and so that's what I've got here. I wanted to show there's a couple different kind of ways you can chop your radishes. Um, I couldn't find watermelon radish today. I, can't, I put that on the list because it's the most beautiful and interesting and a lot of people haven't worked with it before. Um, but any radishes are gonna be good for this uh, meal plan and gonna be good for you. So uh, you can slice them, you can dice them, you can cut them in wedges. Um, there's a lot of different ways. What only thing that I would say is the thinner you slice it, or the smaller you cut it, then the more it's gonna break down throughout the week. So if you leave it in like a little bit of a bigger wedge or a bigger chunk, then it will last more days. Uh, like a good a wedge or a quarter of a radish or a thick sliced radish will last um, for three to four days. If you keep it in cold water, in a container with cold water and maybe a couple drops of lemon juice, it's gonna last five or six days. So you'll have nice crispy, ready to go radishes that are great in salads, great in pastas, great. You can cook them with some of your roasted veggies. Do a lot of things with radishes, they're really good. Same thing with the cucumbers. You can get any kind of cucumber that you would like. Uh, I'm using Persian this week just because they have less seeds. It's more of the, the skin and the, and the good stuff. Um, slice them, dice them, quarter them, cut them into half moons. But again, the thicker they are, the longer that they're gonna last throughout the week. So I recommend like a thick slice um, like that. Where's the camera? There we go. Like a thicker slice or a quarter wedge because then that's not gonna break down and get slimy. You'll, you'll have nice cucumbers ready to go for about four days throughout your whole week. So just have that chopped up and prepped and you're in really good shape for a lot of different things. You can use them for salads. You can mix them into your couscous. You can just have them on the side. I make fatouche salads a lot, which is um, romaine, radishes, cucumbers, pita chips, red onions, tomatoes, and like a red wine, garlic vinaigrette out of this world. So you can basically have that every day and not be unhappy. So there's a lot of really good stuff already ready to go. Um, I've got things ready to go into the oven. So the sweet potatoes, I know I didn't send a recipe for that. It's literally roasted sweet potatoes and any of the spices from any of the other dishes we're making would be really good. So I season my sweet potatoes with the paprika, a little bit of cumin, a little bit of that za'atar seasoning, which is from the salmon, and 
you can season it with anything you want. You can eat, just do lemon, salt, and pepper, and it's, it's fine because then you're going to mix it in with other things that you've got flavor, you've got a lot of stuff already going on with your other dishes, and so just having a good, nice roasted veggie, especially one with a lot of the fiber and maybe some of that good sweetness from the sweet potato, I, I highly recommend that. The pita chips, I did send a recipe for just because you want to be pretty careful about not over salting or over spicing pita chips. Um, but other than that, it's really great to make these for yourself at home. Super simple. I just tear them. You can cut them into perfect triangles if that's important. You can get actual pita pockets and then tear them in half so that they're really thin pita chips. Or these are what they call pita flatbread. And I just tear them into kind of thick, chunky pieces, and we're going to bake that at a high temperature, about 400, I think is what the recipe says. Yes. So same thing. I'm going to roast the sweet potatoes in the same oven. Just get that stuff all going so that it's working while we're doing other work. That's the best part about meal prep. Um, I do also have already done partway through our couscous. Now the recipe that I wrote calls specifically for Israeli couscous, which is the larger pearl couscous. I couldn't find that at the store yesterday or today. Um, I found Mediterranean couscous, which is the much, much smaller uh, pearls of pasta, but it is still pasta. It is still a semolina flour-based pasta, not gluten-free. It's not like quinoa if you need Gluten-free quinoa would be a perfect substitution in this case. Uh, it's also maybe a little bit better for you. Amy can probably tell us more about that. But uh, I like couscous because it is still a little bit of pasta, but you're not eating huge amounts of heavy pasta. And a little bit of that goes a long way. This is also, I've got dried apricots and dried cranberries and some nuts. I chose almonds and pistachios. You can definitely play around with those combinations of nuts and fruits. Remembering that dried fruits have a fair amount of sugar in them, and so small quantities. This isn't your main dish, but using this as your base of grain is, is tasty, and it goes a long way. You can put your salmon on top. You can put your veggies mixed into it. You can put a little bit on top of your salad for the flavor and the sweetness and the crunch of the nuts. Just remember that you're portion controlling everything in your life, just like chocolate, just like everything else, right? So I've got that. I'm still going to be chopping in some parsley and adding some lemon and some olive oil and a little bit of a pomegranate molasses. Uh, I mean, balsamic molasses, but you can use balsamic vinegar. You can omit that entirely. You can just maybe a dash of extra virgin olive oil, which will help it from drying out. That's the only reason that you would maybe want to do that. But you've got a lot of flavor from the dried fruits and then adding a little bit of lemon and parsley. You've got a, a really good amount of flavor without a ton of salt or other stuff going on, especially other fats and things. So that's what I already have working. If you are cooking along with me and you are doing things as I go, um, there's just no way to get it all done in an hour, uh, unfortunately, in our class time. So I wanted you to know what I have ready and what I'm going to be working. So I'm going to put the pita chips and the potatoes in the oven now. Uh, they can then get to work while we are focusing on our salmon and our hummus. I think those are like the two things I really want to get taught and demonstrated today in full. So we're going to start up. So, gotta, where's production, you know? Where's the I, have a I have a question. Yes. Uh, are, we, are we marinating potatoes or just putting directly in the oven? <laughs> Excuse me. I put about two tablespoons of uh, extra virgin olive oil mixed with canola oil. So I do that 50-50 blend. Usually when I'm roasting things in the oven, that's just, I tend to do that because of money and personal taste. But um, so just a little bit of oil, just so that it's coated, but not swimming. You don't need a pool of oil. Uh -huh. Yeah. And then, yes, I tossed it with a little bit of salt and pepper, some paprika, and some cumin. Basically, any of the spices that we have from the other recipes, like the spices from the salmon or the spices that are uh, called for in the pita, like the paprika, any of those flavors would be really good on the potatoes. So I just used a little bit of kind of all of them, and then the olive oil and a teeny bit of salt and pepper, and then I'm just going to, uh, on a nice even layer on a sheet pan with foil into my 400 degree oven. And how long are we going to bake them? 
Um, I cut them pretty small, and the reason I do that is so they don't take very long. If you cut them in very large chunks, it could take anywhere up to a half an hour, but these little dice pieces will probably only take about 15 to 20 minutes. It depends. You're just looking for fork tender as long as your knife goes all the way through, but uh, if your oven is at 400 to 425, it should only take about 15 or 20 minutes. Okay, thank and you. The nice thing about adding a little oil, too, is it does... Um, help us to get more of the antioxidants out of it. So having a little fat increases the absorption of beta carotene. Um, yeah, so. That is, I, there's my thing today. <laughs> I love that. And you get just such a huge amount of vitamin A from, from sweet potatoes in the form of beta carotene. One cup of cubed sweet potatoes has 337% of your daily needs. So, even if you're just tossing, you know, a quarter cup onto a salad or in a wrap, like you're, you're getting all of your vitamin A needs for the day, pretty much. So. Fantastic. Okay. I'm going to move down a little. I think 60B. Yeah. So here in the teaching kitchen, we don't have a stove top, like a burner oven. We have an oven that's underneath the table. And we have these uh, electric burners, which is what I use here. Very different from cooking with gas very different from cooking with gas. Uh, cooking with electric is very sensitive. You, it is just gonna keep cooking. You have to take it off the heat or else your pan will just continue to cook. This hot plate stays very, very hot. But um, this is actually what a lot of people in Los Angeles have to live with because a lot of our cheapest apartments are bachelors. And so all you get is a mini fridge and a hot plate and maybe a toaster oven if you're lucky. So you can do a lot of things. With this, you, know, you shouldn't be too necessarily afraid of cooking. You can do a lot of the hot plate. So I'm going to show you, we're going to sear this salmon. I have got the salmon already seasoned. If you're using salmon with skin on, that's totally fine. It's delicious. And it's like one of the good, healthy ways to get some of your fats, I think. But it's a little bit easier when you're searing it. To take the skin off just because then it doesn't get all shriveled up like see uh, the skin on um, uh, I mean you could definitely do that I just really like this uh, without the skin because then I can get the spices all the way around and it's just a little bit more of a flavored like blackened seared piece of salmon and less about the grilled skin uh, but you can definitely do it with the skin on it's, it's delicious and uh, I would just keep the spices on the side that no skin. So don't put the spices on the skin side. That'll get kind of burnt and crispy if you try to sear that. Just on the on the meat part, okay? So I have mine coated on both sides. Um, I removed the skin and coated it. Still has a little bit of that fat from under the skin, and that's okay with me. But um, got it seasoned on both sides with the za'atar seasoning and teeny, teeny, tiny bit of salt and pepper. Um, I know it says on the recipe what za'atar is. You can make it yourself. It is a traditional mix used in a lot of uh, Middle Eastern and some North African, but it's got sesame seeds, it's got sumac, cumin, coriander, a little bit of salt, and dried thyme is a really big component of it. So it's a really particular spice blend extremely delicious. If you don't have sumac, you can use maybe a little bit of a lighter, uh, like darker in color, but not so spicy chili powder. Um, could be a trade-off for sumac if you can't find that. Although sumac is a little bit sweeter, so then you have to kind of balance it out with other things. But um, they sell za'atar in most stores now. So just like look in the seasoning sections. I got this at Ralph's. Um, in the regular seasoning. It's just a pre-mixed za'atar blend. And then you don't have to have a whole thing of sesame seeds that you're not gonna use or a whole thing of sumac that you're not gonna use. So it's really nice that they make these blends now. So highly recommend keeping this in your pantry along with totally different, but garam masala. Those are the two spice blends that you never used to be able to find. We used to always have to make them ourselves in kitchens, but now you can get them and just keep them around. Really, really delicious to have to make your food more interesting and more fun. Okay, so I can smell that already. All of the different flavors are kind of starting to come up, but everything in there is gonna be working for at least the next 10 minutes, so I'm not gonna stress about it. 
Um, I'm going to get this going. These are these are weird and funny. So I'm going to teach you, even if you never have to use one, then you can have a skill. You turn them on, it's going to beep at me. It's not happy. And eventually it will turn itself off because there's nothing on it. Now it is happy. It won't work unless it's actually connected to a pan. And the pan has to be stainless steel or cast iron. It can't be aluminum. It won't connect to it. I think it's magnetic. So a lot of uh, sensitive issues when you're working with them is not just regulating the heat. I'm going to manage this at what we would call a medium heat. Uh, so that's about at 275 to 300. Uh, when you're looking at high heat on a gas range, that's between 350 and 4. Medium high, 3 to 350. So like there's actually ranges of your gas heat and the temperature it produces. It's different on a gas range, but so I'm going for what we would call medium high heat. Just to get the pan really hot, medium to medium high. So that means I'm at a 280, which is weird. It doesn't even translate. But. I just want to get the pan nice and warm. Then I'm going to add in a little touch of uh, olive oil, about a, maybe a tablespoon tops. You probably only need a teaspoon or two. Uh, I'm using a really good nonstick pan, though. You can see that. So that really helps when you're working with fish. If you uh, don't have a very, very good nonstick pan, then I highly recommend, uh, and this is not the healthiest thing in the world, but the, the absolute foolproof best way to get a perfect sear on a piece of fish if you're using a cast iron or a grill is a splatter of butter and mayonnaise. So you do 50% butter and 50% mayo. Definitely not like healthy, but it burns away. It doesn't cook into your food as much. You get a little coating of the flavor, but what it is is the perfect release. So if you're grilling fish, you can absolutely use like a vegan uh, margarine butter and a low fat mayonnaise. It's just the content of uh, the, the certain kind of fat that it is. Uh, so that heats up really fast and now my pan is smoking because I was talking a lot to you. So I'm going to let it cool down just a touch, let the oil heat up, and then put the fish in. I don't want to burn all of my nice seasonings or burn the fish. So you want to be really careful about heat. Keeping your grill, if you're grilling fish, keep it at 350 with the flame, but make sure you have a really good like splattering of either butter, mayo, a combination of both, or that you really brush your grill or your pan very, very well with like a non-stick spray or oil. Uh, fish will stick. Fish will stick. And so, to make it easier for yourself, these are some tricks that you can so I'm going to coat this well with a little bit of oil. That was maybe a little too much oil. I think I can just pour a little bit out here. So this is about two tablespoons. No, about a tablespoon. Yeah. I'm going to put in my fish. I have cut this filet in half. If you want to cut yours into portions, I would cut them into like two-inch fingers is what we call them. So you cut the filet into slices. Let everybody get about a two-finger uh, two portion. Uh, keep it away if you have a scale and you're looking for about four ounces per person. That's a traditional protein portion. So I've got a warm pan. This is so loud. Warm pan, warm oil. I know the oil is warm because it is pulling away from the center towards the side of the pan. So I'm going to put my presentation side down. Whatever side you want to be the fancy side that you present to yourself, presentation side down, that's the side that you sear first because it gets the nicest color. Okay. I'm going to keep this pan, it just has some seasoning on it, because then I can put my fish back on it after I sear it. I'm probably going to need to finish this in the oven. If you have very thin salmon fillets, then yours might cook through in the pan. But we need to make 
sure that it's cooking all the way through. Uh, most of the way through for safety's sake because this is not sushi grade salmon, right? If you want sushi grade salmon, you can eat that raw. I'm, I'm gonna make sure that this is at least cooked to safety because it's not sushi grade. And so uh, you just wanna be really careful. Salmon is a great dish, especially if it's replacing red meat in the diet. It's super high in monounsaturated fats and um, omega-3 fatty acids, which are really good for our brain health, our mood health, our um, cholesterol levels. And the uh, American Heart Association actually recommends that we eat fish twice a week and of the fattier fishes like salmon. And there's a lot of different ways to fix it, a lot of different seasonings you can use so that it doesn't seem like you're eating the same thing all the time. You can top it with tomatoes and feta. You can um, use different spices, mustards. Um, but I think it's, it's one, of the, one of the things that I try to eat quite often. We will be wow. making it with tofu today. <laughs> okay, so a little bit of black, right, is good. We want this to be sort of a black and spiced salmon, but it's a very fine line between where that starts to taste bitter and firm, right? So you want to be careful. I am using what is actually called a fish spatula. These are um, made for this. They're extremely thin, right? And they have this teeny tiny little lip where you can get underneath that fish. And it's a lot more delicate, and I know that some things are, you can use this for grilled cheese sandwiches too, so don't think that I'm telling you to buy a tool that's only good for one thing, but if you have one good spatula in your arsenal, get a fish spatula, because it's, it's going to make certain things like this a million times easier for you. So I got it nice and seared on both sides, that's all I want to do, because then I'm going to just put it in the oven for about 10 minutes until it cooks through into the center. Salmon and most fish are very fast. This is one of my favorite things to make for dinner because you're ready like that. Um, if you have a, a thick piece of fish, like a halibut or a cod, those are very fast pieces of fish. They take a lot longer to finish, so you want to make sure that you're cooking it all the way through. But salmon is usually like you're 15 minutes and you're done. It's, um, it's a lovely lovely thing and like Amy said any blend of spices any herbs any kind of like garlic oil chili oil you can make salmon taste very different every single time it to me is like chicken in terms of a blank canvas you, you can interject it into a lot of recipes and, and not think that you're eating like the same fish every single day so another reason I use I like to use this not this particular nonstick pan is because it has a metal handle. It is oven safe. I can put this whole thing just right into the oven. Fewer dishes. If I want to though, you've got your sheet pan that has the spices on it. You can just put it right back on there. In fact, maybe I'll do that just for safety. So into the oven that goes. Just to finish, while we're here, we'll take a look at what we've got going on. One of the things about this kitchen, the oven turns to, yeah, okay. So what we are looking for on the pita chips, obviously they're gonna get brown, they're gonna get toasty. They're not gonna be 100% crispy when you take them out of the oven. Don't think that they're not done yet. They need to sit at room temperature for maybe just a couple of minutes and they kind of dry out, they finish the process. So if you let them go too long, they will burn. If you pull them out and you think they're too just not done, let them sit and they'll probably finish crisping up. If after they are 100% cooled down and they're still a little bendy or they don't snap, you can just toast them again, put them back into the oven. It doesn't hurt them to start the toasting process over again. So I'll show you here. I definitely got color, but it's like a good dark brown color right before they burn. Uh, so, toasty, delicious, thick, wonderful pita chips, which I can use to dip into my hummus. I can use as a snack with my sliced cucumbers. I can, like I said, I use these as croutons in my salads all the time. Um, really great for texture and crunch, but I use a good whole wheat pita bread, so it's different than like those super salty store-bought croutons that we can find. So, 
you can use it for lots of different things. I bet Amy has some ideas too. Pita chips are a great. Yeah, I was just thinking the other day. I had a uh, some cottage cheese and oh, um, nice. having having some whole wheat pita chips with it, it was fantastic. What a good idea. Uh, this is a little weird, maybe a little Midwestern, but I love it. We have a recipe in our family. It's cottage cheese dip. It's made with a non-fat cottage cheese, uh, low-fat mayo, but just like a teaspoon or two, and then curry powder. So it's just like cottage cheese and curry, and that with veggie sticks and pita chips is oh, so good. So good. Um, okay, so our sweet potatoes are still working. They just need really only about five more minutes. What you're looking for is a really good... Uh, brown caramelized color around the edges, around the corners of your cuts, and that a fork goes through. So find the biggest piece of sweet potato on your tray and make sure that your fork or your knife goes through and then you know that it's tender and it's cooked. Uh, and then you just want to let that cool and you're good to go. So our salmon is working, which is awesome. We just need to finish that for a couple minutes. Those two things are probably going to come out at the same time. In the meantime, I want to show you this really awesome trick. Um, I love this. Okay, so a lot of people that I know don't want to eat beets because they're messy and they're difficult and they don't know how to roast them or process them. They are kind of annoying. You have to roast them, then you have to peel the skin off and deal with some of these different things. But if you have one towel in your kitchen that you dedicate to beets, if you like beets like I do, I, I make beets a lot. So I've got these roasted already. All I did, so simple, roasting beets. I made sure to cut the stems off, but not cut through the beets because then you're going to bleach out all of your color. So just cut the stems down to the end. If there's a really long rat's tail, we call them, that comes off the end, just cut that off too. So you, all you've got here is your regular shaped beet. I coated it with my hands. With I just put a teeny tiny bit. It was about a teaspoon of the olive oil, canola oil blend, and coated each beet. Uh, just so that it was coated, and then salt and pepper. Just a teeny, 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 tiny bit of salt and plenty of pepper. And then I covered it with that foil, as you saw, I took that off, and I roasted that in the oven, fully covered, for about 20 minutes at my 400 degrees oven. Straight roasted beef. It totally depends on the size of the beef. I specifically got this bunch of beef because they were small. Right now, you can get beef at the store that are like, cantaloupe size. They're monsters. So that's going to take an hour at least to roast in the oven. So go for the smaller beets when you're at the store or at the farmer's market. It's just easier for your own life. You don't need those monsters. Plus, the bigger they grow, the kind of less flavor they tend to have. So pick it when it's like the nice right size, not a giant monster. And so coated, seasoned, just lightly, Cover with foil. Um, I did it in on this sheet pan because that's all I have here. If you have like a, 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 a pan that's about two inches deep, that might be even a little bit better because then you can cover it with the foil nicely. Once they are roasted, all you're looking for, whether that's 20 minutes or an hour, depending on the size of your beet, your paring knife just should go all the way through. No resistance, no, you don't have to push it. Your, your knife should just kind of slide through the beet and it's done. So you're looking for a perfectly tender beet, but you can over roast them. They will just sort of shrivel up and die. So don't forget about them in your oven. And then this is the fun part. You can do it while they're still warm or you can let them cool. It's a little bit easier while they're still warm, but it doesn't matter. Uh, you have your towel that's going to be dedicated to beets because it's going to get pink. But, uh, this makes life a lot easier. So you start at the root end where you cut the roots off and you just take your towel and peel it. You grab that skin and it basically just, it just comes right off the towel. So it's a lot easier than trying to peel it with a peeler. You definitely have to leave the skin on while you roast them. You don't want to roast them peeled already. Um, you can buy beets you know, those little like containers or uh, little plastic bags of beets that are already roasted and peeled for you. No judgment if that's easier for you, if that's within your budget, they're great. They have been roasted and peeled just like this by somebody else. And so you don't get pink fingers, you don't get pink towels, you don't, 
But this is the way that you can do it very easily. You just peel from the root, you kind of peel it back, and then grab the skin, and it just sort of peels, peels away with the towel. Okay, and then you have your nice peeled beets. Once we, you have your roasted beets, all you're doing is cutting them into wedges or dicing them. Really, it doesn't matter what size you cut them in. They will last all week as nicely roasted beets. Uh, traditionally, they're just sort of served as a side. You know, you get those wonderful plates of Middle Eastern food with the roasted and long cooked meats and hummus and the dips and the veggies and the just tomato wedges and, and beet wedges and pickled radishes and all of these amazing, wonderful things. This is just one thing that you can have as part of these these meals and uh, it, it's a nice combination. But also through your week, if you just wanted to mix in like your roasted beets, roasted sweet potatoes, some salad, you're still, it's not, it's not too uh, new or different. You're just eating really, really good, healthy roasted vegetables, right? Amy, I, what's the best thing about beets? Um, they are high in fiber, but the, the main thing is I think they, they're just really high in phytonutrients, um, antioxidants basically, and anti-inflammatories. Um, they have a special phytonutrient that's called betalanes, and um, they're supposed to be very helpful in terms of antioxidant, anti-inflammation, so protecting the body from free radical damage that happens. Um, so, yeah. Um, I love to just have some around. Um, mostly, I, I never had beets in my whole life until I was in my, my adulthood. So I, I missed out on the opportunity to have them. And the first time I had them and loved them was on a beet salad that I made. And I just took some arugula, chopped up some beets. Um, you toss it in like a, a dressing while the beets are still warm. So it kind of absorbs. And then you put a little goat cheese and some, some walnuts on top. And it was... Fabulous, delicious. Um, oh, that's a, that's one of my favorite combinations: roasted beets and goat cheese. Just that just made me so hungry and happy. <laughs> you can eat beets raw. You can shave them very, very thin. If you have a mandolin uh, or you're really good with a knife, you can uh, shave beets and then keep them in cold water in your fridge, and they are fantastic in salads. Um, a very different texture. So some, sometimes you can get beet salads that have roasted beets, raw beets, and pickled beets all in one combination. And it's just, it's a really nice thing. They're, they're, they grow well, they're hearty, they're earthy, they, uh, and there's tons of different colors. If you don't want to end up like this <laughs> with the pink fingers, wear gloves, or they have golden beet, they have uh, candy striped beet, which on the inside have pink stripe, pink and white stripes that run through. They're gorgeous, they make salads prettier, they make snack trays prettier, you know, so make beets a part of your life. <laughs> One interesting thing about beets, studies with beet juice and, and endurance athletes, and the nitrates that are in beets seem to help um, enhance endurance. Yes. So, yeah, if you're going to go run a marathon, drink some beet juice maybe or have a, a, some beets the night before. Yeah. And it also may help to lower blood pressure. Oh, that's so good to know. And they have such good natural sugars in them. Like they really make food sweet. They're, they're sweet. If you... I know for me, when I finally like quit drinking sodas, six sodas a day, um, eating things like beets or grapes that have a high amount of their own natural sugars in them, I was like blown away at how sweet they tasted because, well, soda ruins that palate for sure. But then you find these things in nature that are mind-blowingly sweet, but not, not necessarily as bad for us as a six-pack of Mountain Dew, right? So... Um, like these, our beautifully roasted uh, sweet potatoes. I hope you can see that. There's really good caramelization, really good browning around the corners and edges, and that's it. So that's why I cut them really nice and small, because then they're done. And, you know, there's, I don't want to wait for potatoes to roast or for, like, if I was baking a whole sweet potato, that would take at least an hour. Um, so just let this stuff, the beets and the sweet potatoes and my pita chips, they're all going to cool down. Well, we talked a little bit about the beta carotene in the sweet potatoes, but they're also super high in vitamin C, 
um, fiber, right? Lots of fiber there, um, rich in antioxidants. Those colorful vegetables are where you're going to get those phytochemicals from. Um, so, and one medium sweet potato has about six to seven grams of fiber. So, well, and you notice I left the skin on. Sweet potato skins are definitely edible and they're definitely delicious. So you want you don't want to take away where a lot of your nutrition is. Um, so just make sure you scrub them or wash them under cold water, just like any other potato because they they grow in the dirt. But uh, yeah, if you have a veggie brush or like one of those green scrubbies that you use for vegetables, just make sure you wash the outside and definitely good to go. Don't worry about peeling sweet potatoes. I love the skin. It kind of gets candied a little bit. That's where a lot of the sugars exist. Uh, so uh, salmon is coming out. I wanted to show you this. It's still got its really lovely blackened seared effect on the presentation side, which we did first. And I want to show you, I don't know if you'll be able to perceive this, but it's very firm to, to the touch, right? So if I pressed into it and it was still raw, my finger would just kind of like keep going and it wouldn't come back. So you want to make sure it's firm to the touch and it springs back when you press on it. And that's it. It's cooked all the way through. It also will continue cooking. There's always a carryover heat when you're cooking proteins especially. So that middle is going to finish even if it's not also, even though it's not sushi grade salmon, uh, salmon is safe to eat at a very, very slightly underdone temperature. You can poach your salmon. You can steam your salmon, you can slow roast your salmon, which I love to do. Put a, a little dish of water at the bottom of your oven and then leave your oven at about 225 and slow roast that salmon for about an hour and it's like butter. Mm. So there's a million different things that you can do with salmon and different ways you can play with it. So this is a fun way to have a lot of flavor and spice involved. So if you're trying to introduce salmon into your diet more regularly, Highly recommend this because it doesn't taste fishy. It just tastes like all of those amazing flavors that we added to it, okay? We're the more I make salmon too, the easier. It just seems like it's such an easy thing to make. It's yes. quick. It doesn't create a lot of dishes to wash. And uh, in addition to omega-3s, which is always the first thing that comes to my mind, um, it also is very high in the B vitamins, especially like vitamin B12. Um, it has a fair amount of vitamin D, which we don't get from many different types of foods. So, so that's another plus. It also has potassium, which can help with blood pressure and phosphorus for bones. And um, it's, it's not particularly high in mercury uh, compared to some of the other bigger fishes. So um, it's definitely one of my go-to fish dishes. That's awesome. That's really good to know. We, we all definitely need to be careful about mercury and, and sustainable fishing and all of this kind of stuff. So, yeah, I love, I love salmon for all of the right reasons. Uh, we are going to move into the hummus. The hummus is, I mean, pretty self-explanatory if you know how to follow a recipe, but I want to show you the consistency that you're looking for and the general idea that you can make this your own. Don't, don't follow the recipe like to the letter if it's not exactly what you want it to taste like. I know a lot of people, um, I'm gonna try to turn that off for the sound. Uh, a lot of people like really garlicky hummus. A lot of people like really lemony hummus. Some people like to add cumin powder, like some of it, a lot of it, whatever. Hummus is particular. Some people really like red pepper hummus. You can, you can add roasted red bell peppers to this and make it red bell pepper hummus. There's lots of ways you can play with it. This is my favorite version of classic hummus. So from there, you can expand it in a lot of different ways. But I'm gonna just show you, it is easiest to make in a food processor. If you have a blender that works also, just make sure that you're scraping it and stirring it up while it mixes. If you don't have either of those things, People have made hummus for literally thousands of years in a mortar and pestle. That's how most of those rustic sauces, like even guacamole was made in like a stone ground version of a mortar and pestle. So a lot of those kind of chunky sauces, you don't have to make it as perfectly blended as this machine does, uh, but a mortar and pestle, that good clay or stone bowl that you hammer in, you'll get a really lovely, well ground up, uh, chickpea paste, which then you can mix with all of your other ingredients in a bowl. So you don't have to go out and buy a food processor just to have hummus. 
I will say though, if you really love hummus and you really love making dips or dresses, uh, dressings or sauces or uh, even some baking things, they sell pretty small uh, food processors. It's just like a two cup or a four cup, pretty little guys for um, within you know, $29.99 to $49.99. You don't have to spend an arm and a leg, but to have something that does a lot of really hard work for you, it's a worthwhile investment if you're going to cook a lot. Uh, just as a tip, it doesn't have to be Cuisinart, it doesn't have to be a name brand, it doesn't have to be fancy, and it certainly doesn't have to be big, especially if you're just cooking for yourself. But, uh, it was actually hummus that made me finally buy my own food processor at home because I just love hummus and making it for myself means that I get to make it the exact way that I like it instead of going to the store and then being disappointed that it's not the way I want it to taste. So food processors really do go a long way if you are going to invest in becoming a cook. So I'm just going to get this ready. This food processor locks into place in the front. Some of them lock into place with the handle in the back. They're all different. The lid has to lock on while you're using it, or else it won't turn on. Most of the machines work that way. You have to lock it in place before it starts to run. So I'm following the basic recipe. I've got my chickpeas. If you're using canned chickpeas, always try to make sure that you rinse them under cold water, like in a colander or a bowl sieve. No matter what beans you're using, you always want to do that. These come in like a briny solution, and so you want to rinse away any of the foam, and you want to rinse away any of the extra salt that might have just sort of been sitting around in that liquid. I try to find uh, low sodium beans and chickpeas and, and legumes whenever I can. Uh, but even then, you want to rinse them very, very well. For things like black beans and kidney beans, you just rinse it until that water runs clear. It's no longer black or red. For chickpeas, there's kind of like a foam. So you just rinse it until that foam is gone. And you've got nice, just clear, clean water coming out of your colander and you're good to go. Let them dry. And uh, I've got beans everywhere. I thought I'd cut myself. <laughs> okay. So uh, one thing I started doing with the chickpeas is because it does take a long time if you make them from dried, but you can make a big batch. Um, they have to cook for quite a while. So I'll make a big batch of them and then I'll um, just freeze them in little Ziploc bags. And so when I need like one can of chickpeas, I'll just pull out those. Um, there's nothing wrong with using the canned ones. I do that all the time too. I just kind of like the taste of the other ones a little bit better. They're not quite as soft. Um, yes. But canned beans might actually work better for something like hummus um, that you're going to be blending up. You want it to be creamy. Yeah, you do really want them to be well cooked so that they do get that creamy aspect. But you can absolutely do that when you make them yourself. Even if you have them pre-made, you can then kind of finish cooking them, you know, soften them up even more. Um, making chickpeas or other beans from scratch is uh, a wonderful skill to have and it's not complicated it's just time consuming for sure so if you have a slow cooker or a instant pot or a crock pot those actually do well because then you can just kind of like leave it and not worry about the, the stove being on all day long um, I do I tend to make my uh, from scratch black beans in my crock pot because then I can just get it all going in the pot put all my flavors and seasonings in and then leave it on low for like seven hours and I don't have to worry too much about it. But uh, like Amy said, this way you can actually flavor it too. If you cook your chickpeas from scratch, you can put uh, lemon and paprika and garlic and parsley stems and uh, whole stem cinnamon sticks and all kinds of flavor into the water while it cooks. And then you have, well, a far better product that you can use in salads and other things, just as a side dish. But yeah, for hummus, a nice, plain cooked chickpea is sort of the way to go. Uh, unless you cook it with all of those other flavors and then those go really well with oven, so it doesn't really matter. I think beans of any kind, if you can add beans to your diet, it's great. So garbanzo beans, black beans, um, pinto beans, any of them, super high in fiber, a half a cup of 
chickpeas, for instance, have six grams of fiber in it, um, especially high in soluble fiber, which can help with reducing blood sugar, reducing cholesterol. Um, they're good sources of iron and folate. And um, so lots of reasons for including more beans. Really high in protein too, about six grams of protein in a half a cup, which is about the same amount as one ounce of, of, of meat. Wow. Wow. I didn't used to like beans as a kid. The texture just felt like uh, like mama bird had already chewed it up a little bit for me. I was very imaginative as a child. So I, uh, I've, I've become more accustomed to the texture and I've, I've been missing out because they're also just a, a really wonderful conduit for flavor because they get so creamy in the middle. They absorb a lot of wonderful herbs and spices when you cook slow cook beans. It's yeah, really good, really, really good. I'll try to post some recipes in our recipe catalog uh, just so you can try them at home. So I've got my well, rinsed and strained chickpeas in the mixer. I have got my garlic already in here too. Um, I'm using two very large cloves of garlic and I just smashed them and kind of rough chop them so that they're uh, giving a little head start. The food processor is amazing, but if you put in a whole clove of garlic, it might not get blended into your hummus as well as you want it to. So just rough chop. That gives it a head start. I'm adding my tahini. Tahini is an amazing, delicious, wonderful thing. That is uh, sesame paste. And it is hummus. So I think that you probably, if you notice on the shopping list for this meal prep, I try to put substitutions that you can use for some ingredients. There is no substitution for tahini. You can make your own tahini out of sesame seeds. That would be really difficult and time consuming. So if you can't find tahini at your store, try maybe a, like a Middle Eastern or Mediterranean market. I know there's some around town and uh, they sell it on Amazon or you can order it online from like Target or one of those other stores if you're not into Amazon, which is cool, that's fine with me. Um, I couldn't find it yesterday at Ralph's, oh, um, but I did find it at Whole Foods. They usually have it at Ralph's. I think they were just maybe out of it. I'm not sure, um, but they did have it at Whole Foods. I, I went to the Ralph's this morning, but it was the uh, Ralph's in Hollywood on La Brea. I couldn't find it where I would expect to find it, but then I found it in the kosher section with the other brands, the, the Sadaf brand that makes a lot of different things. I, I found it near that. So sometimes you kind of have to think outside the box of like, where else might they put that? Or, you know, ask somebody that works at the store because it might be in like kind of a weird place. But um, yeah, it's spelled, oh, thank you, uh, tahini. Um, oh, perfect, Trader Joe's has it, it's really good to know. That's, a, that's convenient for a lot of people. Thank you for putting that in there. Um, if you don't find this brand, that's fine. It, it, Sometimes they often come in like a screw top jar. Whatever you do, it's very much like natural peanut butter. You have to stir it like crazy. If you just open it and pour it in, all you're gonna get is oil and water. And all the paste is at the bottom. You have to mix it extremely well before you use it, okay? So just something to know about tahini. But yeah, it's not really replaceable with any other flavor. This is what makes hummus taste like hummus. So I got that quarter cup, I'm gonna squeeze an extra teaspoon in because I like it. And I have my garlic in there already. I'm gonna add my lemon juice. I'm starting with two tablespoons, but I might add more after I mix it and taste it. Um, I've already got this, this was a fresh lemon I squeezed. You can absolutely use like lemon juice from concentrate in one of those bottles. Although we're in California and it is lemon season, so. Just steal one from your neighbor or something. I'm exactly. Sure. Okay. Uh, salt and pepper are important. Um, it won't really, you can't bring out the lemon or the tahini flavor without at least a little bit of salt, but it is very, very light. It's about a half a teaspoon of salt for the whole recipe. Um, we might add a little bit more, but probably not. And then we're gonna go with black pepper, same thing, about a half a teaspoon. In the end, if you like things to taste like black pepper, then you can add more. That's not really the traditional flavor of hummus, so I'm gonna keep it kind of light. You can use white pepper. A lot of people use white pepper when they're making hummus because then it doesn't look like there's little specks of dirt. 
in your hummus. Um, but I'm the only one eating this, so I know it's not dirt, it's okay. Uh, but that is actually very important. That's, the, that's one of the only reasons I keep white pepper around is for when I'm making things that need to look very, very white or beige or clean, and I don't want it to look like it got covered in dirt. That's, that's when you use white pepper. Uh, also, it has just a little bit of a more mild flavor than black pepper. It's a little bit less spicy and a little bit more peppery. Like it, it tickles my nose more, but it tastes less sharp. I don't know. That might be a very personal thing. You might have a very different experience with white pepper. Some people hate it. Uh, and that's to each their own. I'm going to add about two tablespoons of my oil. You can definitely just use regular olive oil. It can be extra virgin. You can use canola oil if that's all you have. But olive oil is the traditional oil used for hummus. Uh, so I'm going to start with two and then probably add one more as I mix. And then I need to have water, uh, which I have right here. Water is what actually makes hummus the consistency that we want it. When you blend it with just oil, it's going to look broken and separated and kind of gross. And you're like, oh no, I messed the whole thing up. And then you drizzle in the water and it's hummus. All of a sudden it's perfect. So don't throw away your hummus just because it looks a little funny. That's where the water comes in. So it's gonna be a little bit noisy. Sorry, I'm just going to start this. I'm going to pulse it. So what that means is I'm not pressing the on button. I'm pressing the pulse button, which just means it'll it'll only stay on as long as I'm holding the button. And I want to do that because it helps jump the chickpeas up around in the container, which mixes it for me so I don't have to go in and scrape it. If you're using a blender, make sure that you're kind of scraping the bottom each time you mix it. But you want to use the I guess I would say the puree setting if you're using a blender, because you really want it to be a, a well-blended uh, puree. So I'm just going to pulse this up. You can see, though, it's still going to get stuck to the sides, especially the less liquid that you have in there. So before I start adding the water, we're just going to give it one quick scrape down the sides and around the bottom to make sure everything's going to nicely. And then at this point, it's just going to be alternating water and any more of the olive oil that you need to get it to be a fully blended and really smooth consistency. So I'm going to leave it on low at this point.
Now you want to taste it, obviously. Got a nice, well blended, smooth hummus. But we have no idea how it tastes until you actually taste it. You need to make sure. So I'm definitely getting the tahini, the garlic. Lemon is a little bit, I think I want a little bit more lemon. The lemon is uh, going to make it taste really bright and fresh. And I'm not getting as much of that bright freshness that I want. Also, that lemon is going to add just another maybe teaspoon or so of liquid, which helps the consistency again. Actually, a pretty good source of iron. So the fact that you put quite a bit of lemon juice in there is great because that will help us in, increase our iron absorption. Nice. That's really good to know. Okay, so I'm going to put this over here with the rest of our stuff and give you a little sneak peek. We're just a couple minutes from the end, but uh, we have got our delicious Zatar blackened salmon. Some couscous salad, which at the end, uh, I'm just going to mix in some chopped parsley and a little of that pomegranate glaze. Or if you just have pomegranate, I mean, balsamic vinegar, a teaspoon, you know, just to toss in will help it from drying out and help flavor the whole salad. Um, and about a, maybe two teaspoons of extra virgin olive oil and a little teeny touch of balsamic goes a long way to adding flavor and to keeping the couscous from drying out throughout the week. So you've got that. Got your chopped salad veggies ready to go. Sweet potatoes are fantastic on top of the salad. Mix into the couscous or just have on the side of your fish. Our pita chips, which we all need snacks throughout the week, right? So really great alternative to potato chips or Cheetos or my weakness is Funyuns. For some reason, I can't stop with Funyuns. <laughs> this is much better for me to dip into some of my dips, right? We've got roasted beets, which once you chop them up, Put them in anything, put them in everything. Make that salad Amy was talking about. It's, oh, get you some beets and goat cheese in your life. It is classic. Some hummus, which I'm just gonna snack on. I'm gonna make a lot of wraps. I'm gonna put my salmon into a pita wrap. I'm gonna make a whole wheat hummus and veggie wrap at one point for lunch this week. So lots of flavor, lots of good health, a lot of maybe new ingredients and new spices for you, which is really, really important. As you cook more, just play with those spices, play with different cultural influences and, and have fun. So, are there any other questions or comments or concerns? Oh, good. I'm glad. Questions. I know Amy has so much good, you just keep like, I've learned so much from you though, Julia. It's, it's been amazing. <laughs> well, this has been a lot of fun. And this is, I know it was a little bit more of like a, a new experience in the kitchen today, but I think it worked out all right. We'll get a better camera. And so I won't be as grainy next time, but we're gonna start making this work for us. Oh yeah, the peeling of the beets. It will change your life, all right, yeah. Don't, don't be afraid of having roasted beets in your diet because of the peeling is messy and annoying and how do I even do that? Yeah, let, let this uh, inspire you all. <laughs> um, yeah, all right. If there's anything else, let us know. If you want to send us pictures, we love to see those. Oh, good. Thank you. It, really enjoy this food this week. You all uh, enjoy this whenever you choose to make it. Have fun with it. And let us know if you have any questions. We're always here for you.
Bye. Bye, everyone. Have a great week.